up your own genome, sequence it all the way back to Africa, find out what your ancestry and uh, ethnic parentage is, avoiding the stupid concepts of race uh, that have oppressed us for so long. According to him, by the time we decided to abandon the environment for which our bodies are still adapted, the African savanna, it's very probable due to volcanic eruptions blotting out of the sunshine uh, by particulate matter um, and other terrible occurrences that we were as a tribe down to less than a few thousand individuals before deciding we better get out of this place. We better move on up and out where it's cooler. It's only a, a very, very contingent matter that we made it uh, this far. And we did not make it because we were helped. We did it by our own unaided effort, if I can put it like that. And our organs, as you can see, when you examine the appendix, uh, the jawline, the coat of fur that you grow and shed in the womb when you're three months old, still adapted, annoyingly for us, as, as are your knee joints and many other things, to the African savannah that we had the good sense in time to abandon. Now, uh, that's not the worst of it. You've got to now think what's going to happen to the cosmos and our place in it. I've got two minutes. I'll make the best use of them I can. In the observable universe, the observable universe, there are 400 billion galaxies. Anyone claiming to know enough about this profusion to infer a plan from it had better be very well informed, and I congratulate anyone who tries. When I say observable, I mean something else that's also contingent. Edwin Hubble, a few decades ago, made the discovery those galaxies are moving away from each other at a very rapid rate that leaves red light behind it. I don't think anyone no long, any longer denies it. Most scientists thought, on operating on usual gravitational principles, that that rate would have to slow down by now. They'd be expanding, yes, but the rate would be slowing. No, it's not. It's expanding. The rate is going up. It's getting faster. It's getting close to doubling. That's only 10 years ago we found that out. That means that galaxies are going to be pulled apart faster than light and going to cause them to drop out of view. That means that the reference points for measuring expansion will go and will dilute everything we found out about the Big Bang to nothingness. In fact, to put it as the great physicist Lawrence Krauss has put it, it will erase all the signs that the Big Bang ever occurred. In other words, those who say to you, how is there something instead of nothing, have got to explain to you how well designed it is, how predetermined it is, that very soon in physical time, there will be a great deal of nothingness where once there was something. And that this is part of the plan. That the plan is for nothingness. And in local news, more local news, the Andromeda galaxy is headed our way directly, collision course, much more local news, just our little suburb of the universe. And it will hit us in five billion years, which is to say, in, in real time, tomorrow. <laughs> in real time, that's very soon. Uh, and that's part of the design. Whose design? What kind of designer? What kind of caprice? What kind of incompetence? What kind of cruelty? What kind of nihilism? What kind of commitment to nothingness? And in the meantime, in the little suburb where we dwell, every other rock in our solar system is inhospitable to life as being too hot or too cold, as is large tract too hot, too cold of our own planet, which is on a climatic and ecological knife edge, as we have good and better and more recent reason to know, and that it is as likely that we'll be able to get out of the way of this and move elsewhere in response to the climate crisis as it is in response to the Andromeda crisis. And that those who try and teach you differently are asking you not to use your intellectual or analytical capacities at all, but to do something very old, very backward, like the Aztecs, like the pre-Galileo, stupefied human beings who didn't know the microorganisms were there, who didn't know about the Big Bang, who didn't know about the red light, and simply to place everything you have on a leap of faith. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, don't do it. You know better. Everybody now knows better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. By your extended clapping, you're eating up into the next speaker's time. Uh, Mr. Richards. Thank you. Uh, it's terrific to be here. I, I count it a privilege to be here to be the antagonist today of Mr. Christopher Hitchens. Uh, when I agreed to do this, I called a very prominent Christian philosopher, the closest thing to a sort of professional debater on the existence of God there is. 
guy named William Lane Craig, and I said, Bill, I'm going to do a debate at Stanford in January with Christopher Hitchens. He said, you maybe have some words of encouragement for me. And he paused. He said, he's the most rhetorically gifted of all the new atheists. Uh, this is not a word of encouragement. <laughs> You've seen rhetorical giftedness here. But we're here to debate a specific subject. What's the subject? The question is atheism versus theism, right? That's the title of the event. Atheism versus theism and the scientific evidence of intelligent design. Now, neither of us expects either a consensus, of course, on this question, but neither of us expects a knockdown, drag out argument that establishes with mathematical certainty the answer to the question. What I want you to consider here for a few minutes, I've got 12 minutes, I want you to ask the question this way. Let's treat atheism and theism as competing hypotheses, competing attempts to explain the world around us. And consider the things that we know either with absolute certainty or that we know pretty darn certainly. All right? And say which of these things, which of these hypotheses best explains the facts that we take for granted? Atheism or theism? In which place, in which worldview are these things we believe to true most at home? Now, I'm not a literary scholar or a theorist. I'm a lowly analytic philosopher. And so I want, what I want to do is give you essentially a laundry list of facts that I think clearly are better at home in a theistic understanding of the universe than in an atheistic understanding of the universe. Some of these things are evidences for intelligent design. They're drawn from specific evidence and knowledge and discoveries we've made in the natural sciences in the 20, in 21st centuries. Others are things that we know simply from introspection. The first of these, I would call to your attention, is our knowledge and certainty of certain moral truths. Whether you're an atheist or a theist, a Jew, a Christian, or an agnostic, there's just certain things that you know are true about reality. Whatever your sociology professor may have told you, for instance, you know that it's simply wrong to torture little children just for the fun of it. You know that's true. I'm not saying you believe it. I'm not saying you simply believe it as a sort of cultural condition that you're shaped by. I'm saying that you actually know it. You know it with a degree of certainty, at least as certainly as you know that there is an external universe. Mr. Hitchens knows it as well as I do. These are simple moral truths. It doesn't mean there aren't complicated moral truths on which we can ask difficult questions. But there are basic moral truths, odds, that we accept and we recognize. Now the question here is this. It's not whether atheists can adhere to moral truths or they can know them. In fact, the Christian tradition has always been unanimous in saying, as Paul said in the book of Romans, that the Gentiles, although they did not have the law, nevertheless had the law written on their hearts. The question is, of the two competing hypotheses we're considering this evening, atheism and theism, in which one is our knowledge of moral truths most at home? The atheist perspective, atheism is something like the claim that there's no such person as God, that the fundamental reality, the thing from which everything else derives, is something like the material universe. As Carl Sagan put it in his great Cosmos series, the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. That's the fundamental reality. It's an impersonal reality. It doesn't exist for a purpose. It doesn't call us to any particular purpose. The theistic claim is that the fundamental reality is a personal being, a transcendent, eternal, personal being of maximal greatness and maximal goodness, which defines and calls everything else into existence, which has purposes and intentions from eternity. Now, this being is, by definition, goodness and love according to the theistic view. The claim is not that if you're a theist, you recognize moral truths, and if you're an atheist, you don't. The question is, is whether theism or atheism is a better metaphysical home for the knowledge we all have of moral truths. I would argue that it's clearly the theistic and not the atheistic perspective that, uh, uh, that most encompasses and accommodates this claim. Now let's turn to some scientific questions. There's a great essay by physicist Eugene Wigner called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Physical Sciences. What is discernible from the natural world? But I do think there is enough discernible from the public evidence that is available, from the direct introspection to which we all have access, and the best knowledge we have from the natural world, to conclude that there is something like a God. Observing is this strange sort of discovery that we made, especially in the physical sciences, that nature seems to be structured, at least in part of its aspects, according to mathematical formalities. This assumption that there's a rationality, a rational order that can in some sense be reduced to mathematics is not the sort of thing we had any reason to expect. Nevertheless, in the West, the founders of modern science who did assume that, people like Kepler and Copernicus and Galileo, 
They assumed that the natural world was rational, that it made sense, that if they worked hard enough, they could discover an underlying pattern, and that our minds could discern that underlying pattern. Now, why did they discover that? Why did they assume it as a statement of faith? They assumed it because they had a theistic worldview. They assumed the natural world was rational, that it was ordered, and that the human mind was constructed such that it could, if it worked hard enough,